everyone and welcome to rebellious ufology or it's it's all good all on rebellious ufology <laughs> i'm lynn hurley with my dashing co-host mr jim goodall how are you jim uh i'm jim goodall and i'm doing just fine i've been batching it for the last f five days i uh, uh, my, my wife has been wanting to go back to seattle since about uh 2019 <laughs> Oh, and wow. because of, because of certain and she can fly for free. She's a, a retired uh, flight attendant. Oh, nice. She absolutely hates flying. <laughs> so she hates the hassle. She hates the hassle. No. So she's up there right now and they uh, experienced their 13th 90 degree day. Normally they only have two a year and they've already had 13 so far. I believe that. And and, and here in here in Southern Arizona, we have tornado warnings and large hail warnings, not necessarily in my neighborhood, but the next town over, Marana, on the way up to Casa Grande. And it's 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 part of the remnants of that the Hurricane K that uh, helped put out some of the wildfires in Southern California. Yeah. Where they got they got a year's worth of rain in 10 hours. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So Crazy. Uh, my grandparents well, used to live in Casa Grande. I went there all the time as a kid. Yeah, it's it's sort of yeah, it's sort of halfway between Tucson and, and mm -hmm. Phoenix. And I used to call it Casa Grande. And he said, No, it doesn't deserve to be said that way. It's just <laughs> Casa Grande. <laughs> oh, okay. <I> <laughs> Whatever you say. I got told the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I gotta do one thing while you're chatty. I gotta turn the fan yeah. a little bit higher. It's it, yeah, no worries. So Humidity's what, would, gone up through the roof right now. Yeah, no worries. So we have, for those of you who don't know, it just popped by, we have Soraya Azkath on today. And if you don't know Soraya, let me tell you a little bit about him because he's awesome and you guys are going to absolutely love him. Uh, Soraya has been studying the unknown for over 30 years and is currently working on a couple of books about it, an autobiography and a book on new ways of looking at various phenomena. He and I have talked about this when we were on Space Out Radio, and he has a really, really fascinating way of looking at some of these things, and I absolutely love it. So I can't wait to talk more. Uh, his studies have spanned the world of the unexplained. UFOs and lost civilizations have been a strong focus throughout, but he's delved into most subjects involved in this work. He's also <clears throat> had a lifetime of strange experiences himself. He's been in radio for over 25 years now, hosting a heavy metal-based show called The Last Exit for the Lost as well. He doesn't like Metallica, but I'm not going to hold it against him. All right. Are you ready? Should we bring him on? Absolutely. Right. Will. Yeah. Hey, Soraya, welcome to the show. Hey. So and that's true. I don't like Metallica. I know. Yeah. I'm very sad that it broke my heart, but I, I, I looked past <laughs> it because it was such a good conversation last time. I like I like 50s doo-wop. That's what I grew up with. So <laughs> <laughs> a little bit different than heavy metal. A little yeah. bit. Yeah, I can't say yeah, I'm not a heavy. I'm like I'm not a heavy metal person, but I'm like an '80s hair band kind of like oh, okay. the Warrants, you know, um, all of the Guns and Roses. Right, right. Yeah. Amazing, amazing music. Yeah. But music was great. So you know? where are we where are we heading off today, there, Lynn? 
Well, I don't know. So Sarai and I, like, I think I was trying to remember because we talked about so many different things the last time we chatted and it was so yeah. fun. But the thing that really, really stood out to me was I remember we started talking about, I think we delved into this a little bit, um, because you had this idea and I had had the same idea, which was that our consciousness maybe creates some of the things like the weird kind of paranormal things we experience, right? So we know right. like PK abilities are, you know, like psychokinetic abilities. Right. People can move things like telekinesis. But I also think that like, I think what got us started on it was when I was, um, I had had this theory for a while based on the ever so technical um, paranormal like ghost hunting shows on TV um, that <laughs> which are fun. They're fun. I'll admit them um, that. And I've noticed this with a lot of people too, like other groups, that if you go in expecting to find a demon, you're going to have like demonic activity. Sure. If you go in expecting to find a, a child, you're going to have childlike activity. Yeah. So why is that? Is that just because those are the things that people associate with that. And, and that's because that's the activity that's happened or are we creating some of that phenomena? I, I, I think there's multiple things happening. I think in some cases you go into somewhere where there, there appears to be a child ghost and there might be a child ghost, mm -hmm. but there are numerous cases where, you know, there are these stories. I know David Weatherly talks about one where there's a plantation down South where there's this whole story about this woman who, you know, all this horrible thing happened to her and she left the plantation and numerous people have seen this woman. They have gotten pictures of her. There's actual it, apparitional pictures. She never existed. Is this the Myrtle's plantation that you're talking I, about? I think so. It was like a, it was a slave woman. And I think yeah. supposedly she like poisoned the whole family or something. If I remember right, correctly. Right. I, I think that, I think that's the one. And he said she never actually existed. Wow. I mean, uh, how, I mean, going back in, into the uh, hitherlands, you know, in the distant past, how how can they say without a doubt that she never existed? Uh, because they could trace where the story came from. Okay. Hmm. You know, so if she did exist, it was purely coincidental. They they were able to trace the origins of the story that was being told, and it was complete invention, like a lot of urban, you know myths are. Yeah. Um. But. The thing is, like, so, yeah, there can be situations where there, things are exactly what they seem to be. Or it could be there's something there that then takes the form of our expectations. Or it could be us completely projecting something onto the situation. It could be an area that heightens our sensitivities. Um, and from scientific work, we know things like PK exist. We know things like uh, uh, PK, any any kind of psycho, you know, precognition psychokinesis uh all this stuff has been scientifically proven there's more evidence for it than there is for dark matter and yeah. if you look at the site you know the scientists will be like oh no dark matter exists but that stuff doesn't and i always find that double standard really amusing uh so we had with we, we're on safe ground assuming that that can play a part uh especially when we realize how much of what we are is not fully conscious to us in this state you know, I mean, people don't realize that, but if you get hypnotized, you often don't remember it. I know that's freaked people out, you know, when they see themselves under hypnosis and they're like, I didn't, I don't remember any of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, your dream world is completely created by you. Well, at least in some cases, there may be other, yeah. other versions of that too. Um, and at the same time, you have no real say in that unless you're lucid dreaming. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of stuff you just do on a daily basis that you never think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's the, uh, what Colin Wilson called the robot. Mm -hmm. And that's like 80% of our lives. Sometimes they're routines. They're things we yeah. put no thought into whatsoever. So uh, there's a lot going on with, with who we are. There's a lot of levels of that. And we're just kind of like this little sliver here that we think, Oh, this is us because we're conscious of that right now. Right. So to say we could create yeah. something unconsciously with PK energy, especially, like I said, in an area that might heighten those senses in us is not that far fetched. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've been, I've been hypnotized a number of times for I quit smoking. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's great for that type of stuff. And, but, but a buddy of mine who's a neurologist said hypnotism for quitting smoking only works for about 60 to 90 days. Hmm. That, 
the rest of it's willpower. Hmm. Ah. But it and, gets you started. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah. I, you know, I, so I quit smoking. I was smoking three packs of cools a day and I quit on March uh, uh, 13th, 1978. I haven't tested a cigarette since. That's awesome. <laughs> so, it, so apparently it works. And I also do the same thing to lose weight. I went from 375 to 260 in five months. Wow. wow. Being hypnotized. And I remember every bit of that session. And it was a mm -hmm. real, and there was a, like five of them. It was very, very deep, uh, you, know, you know, real deep session. Mm. And she said, you're the easy, one of the easiest people I've ever hypnotized. This is the last person to hypnotize me. And and I said, well, <laughs> I guess I'm easy. I said, <laughs> no, I said, I said, oh, it says, yeah, actually, uh, I'm the type of person would, it, that may have been a challenge to get to get through because my mind is always going a thousand miles an hour with a yeah, hundred yeah. different subjects. But it's uh, the mind. The mind is interesting, and and you know when you, when you think you're going to be, you're going to see a. a a female ghost or a baby or you know an old a relative you know it's almost it's almost a uh, uh, self fulfilling self fulfilling prophecy if if you're looking you you know you're going to see somebody and oh, all of a sudden you do right mm -hmm. it may be all up between the ears and and not actually you know, really happen well there's there's also the way the brain actually informs us of what it's picking up which is not one for one. I mean, the brain picks up an enormous amount of data that it just throws out. It mm -hmm. interprets that data before it actually gives it to us. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, you, you, if you assume, oh, I'm expecting to see this, and then you walk around and something of vaguely of that shape looks like it, you're going to think you saw that. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, sometimes you'll correct it after a moment and be like, wait. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot, a lot of that is if if you're looking for a flying triangle, TR3B or a flying saucer or a UAP, whatever garbage name they put on it today, <laughs> uh, you, you can you can look up there and and living in Tucson, we have very few. We have uh, our neighborhood has no lights, mm -hmm. no, no street lights. We have so we can see the stars. So I'm outside all the time at night looking up. And I also worked at Kitt Peak with National Observatories. And uh, I've been up there at the middle of the night. You're at 7,000 feet. You're 50 miles from the closest light source. You can see a lot of things out there. And, mm. and, I've, and I, every night I'm up there looking. And not once has, have I seen something I couldn't explain. And it drives me nuts because I really, really want to see a flying sauce. I really do. Well, you know, <laughs> and, the, the thing with any paranormal activity, though, too, is that a lot of this stuff happens when we need it. Like it's it's yeah. it's it happens in those liminal points of our life. Um, I, what did Jeffrey Kripal say? I love the quote. It was something like the the supernatural happens in our lives for a reason. So. I, I had started working on my autobiography and I was just throwing down the weird stuff that happened. And then I think it was Mike Cleland asked me, well, what happened when you saw that giant UFO? What was going on in your life? And I'm like, I don't know. Now I got to look. And it turned out to be at a huge shifting point of my life. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, son of a bitch. All right. And then I started looking and going, yep, all the weird stuff happens in, in like packs of weirdness. And usually when things were shifting in my life. So there's something about liminality and change that the, the paranormal connects with. And that, that's another reason why consciousness makes sense to a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that too. And I have noticed that myself, um, like, in, especially in periods of transition, like a lot of transition, I'll have a lot more yeah. um, weird kind of paranormal activity in my house. Aside from the haunted doll collection, um, <laughs> uh, though Enzo, Enzo, we don't know where Enzo is. He's not here to appreciate the dolls. He hates them. Um, but yeah, I have noticed that like in times where there's a lot of transition, um, there is a lot more kind of weird stuff that happens. Yeah. Well, I, think it op it, I think it opens your mind up uh, when yeah. things are weird things are going on and, and it may be most of the time you only have a small little opening like so, but mm -hmm. If a lot of crazy things are happening, maybe it, it opens up and you can you can you can see around the corner. You can see in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly one of the one of the things that's probably happening. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do you no, think I, of this like phenomena that seems to be happening? It was definitely much bigger, I think, a few years back, but um, like the Slender Man phenomena. So, so this sort of like egregore topa, you know, kind of mass consciousness creating uh, yeah, that's, entities. That, that's more a tulpa. And I, and I think all this stuff kind of works like that to a degree. I think Slender Man's the first time we had something on a mass scale where people started experiencing something that was literally and traceably created. Right. But I, I think a lot of that stuff happened. Like when you have monster flaps, I think maybe the first couple of people who witness it are the ones who are defining what that monster is. And then everyone else witnesses it, see something similar and eventually it just fades away. Almost like something is projecting here and only has limited time to be here. And it has to kind of pick a form. Hmm. Interesting. Or we just have limited attention spans. <laughs> so, well, when I'm, when I'm talking about like flap flap zones, you have areas yeah. where, you know, it happens for like a year or six months and then everything just dies down. Interesting. So I wonder if that could account for things like Dogman sightings, you know? So like Dogman, it seems like I'm, and I'm not like crypto is not like my thing necessarily, but you know, obviously talking with people, you you learn things in this community. Right. But um, it seems like, especially Dogman, I've noticed like certain areas will be like, ooh, Dogman, there's a lot of Dogman sightings in, in such and such an area, but not so much anywhere, you know, else. And then that was one that I've noticed seems kind of like shifting, you know, like in different mm-hmm. areas. Yep. Yeah, I don't know what to make of Dogman, honestly. I mean, it's with weird. Bigfoot, with Bigfoot, you can argue there are certain areas where a uh, undiscovered primate could thrive without us being able to get a hold of it. You know, yep. uh, but there's too many Bigfoot sightings in areas that that doesn't work. Mm. And as Joshua Cutchin and Tim Renner's books show, there's paranormal activity rife throughout Bigfoot sightings uh, of all kinds, and most Bigfoot researchers just ignore it because they're not looking for paranormal stuff. They're looking for a flesh and blood ape. Hmm. So do you think, so there's the theory then that Bigfoot is interdimensional. What do you think of that idea? I think it depends what you mean by interdimensional. Like I, we don't really have a good structure for what interdimensional means. It's kind of like explaining a mystery with a mystery. Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Going from one dimension to the other. That's my right. understanding. Yeah. <laughs> That's I, all I, I can tell you. <laughs> what, what, what I find interesting is John Keel's super spectrum idea, mm-hmm. which is that these things are outside our, our visible light spectrum. Oh. Okay. We have a very, very narrow band that we can physically yeah. see. Yeah. And I and know there's... Uh, yeah, go, go on. I know, oh, I know there's, there's been people have taken photos or something when they're looking at with with their naked eye, there's nothing there. When they get on their on their smartphone and they start flipping through the uh, videos or the the stills, they see something. Now, why can my my camera see it and my eyes can't? Is because you're limited by the range. And I'm sure if you put some you know some type of filter, where you you're going to filter out a certain wavelength or you're going to enhance a certain group of you know band of uh, wavelength of you know mm-hmm. visible or an invisible light. You know, there's probably th- there probably stuff that would scare the hell out of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and John Keel noticed that things came in from one end of the spectrum and tended to go out through the other, mm-hmm. uh, almost like they were passing through our visible spectrum, uh, especially UFOs, the, the, the way the lights, uh, cause I, I want to say he it comes in in ultraviolet and goes out through infrared or vice versa, mm-hmm. but you have plenty of evidence of like, even there, there was even an episode of uh, UFO hunters. I think it was the one where they were talking about cops experiences mm-hmm. and, there's a police helicopter and it's not the only time this has happened where they had a FLIR camera pointing out the back of the helicopter and there's an object following them Hmm. and they can't see that object. There's nothing there to their visible, you know, to their eyes, Mm -hmm. but they're getting this swirling mass of an object that is following the helicopter and they're only seeing it on the infrared. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, what do do you, what do you make up? Uh, as far as paranormal and, and things happening, I, I live in a suburb of Tucson. I live about 18 miles north of downtown. It's a new area. My wife used to travel a lot. She'd be gone for a week, week and a half at a time. And I'll be sound asleep or I'd be you know, in bed. I will hear people coming, walking through my house, moving things. I can feel someone, I can feel someone get, in, get in bed and I'll roll over. And this is before we had Scarlet. That's my dog. Yeah. Um, 
and it, it was just, I said, well, who's, who's visiting me? Who's visiting me tonight? And it's just really <laughs> weird. And, and I'll hear footsteps and I have, you know, in the, in here in the desert, the, you know, the foundation is a concrete slab and then you put the, the, uh, tile or your, your, whatever your floor coverings over it. Yeah. So you're not going to hear the creaking and stuff you were in a wood frame house, especially an older house. But I hear footsteps at night, not all the time, but every once in a while when I'm totally alone. Right. And right. it just, uh, and I, and I, and my, my mom's family are, are all Sicilian. And my grandmother used to be able to uh, do remote viewing back you know, around the turn of the last century. My, uh, my grandfather was in charge of all the Sicilian, uh, Italian, and uh, you know, what is it? Portuguese fishermen from San Francisco to San Pedro. And they would go up to Alaska. They'd be gone for five months. No communication. This is 1901, 1902, that time frame. And the, all the all the ladies of, of Pittsburgh, California, would would uh, come to my grandmother. She was the matriarch, and said, uh, "Is Giuseppe okay, or is is Ferdinand okay, or is, or is Salvatore okay, or how much did they have in their pay envelope?" And my grandmother said, "Well, I when I visit my great aunt tonight in a dream, I ask her." And she was almost always right on the button. No. Wow. And yeah, I mean, the, the, the voices and footsteps, I get that a lot. Um, sometimes I'm quite sure it's in my head. Um, and sometimes it happens the minute I lay down. Like it's not because, I mean, when you hit that that hypnagogic and uh, I forget what the other word for it is, there's one where you're waking up and one where you're falling asleep and your brain starts giving you dream imagery while you're still awake or while while you're waking up, your brain is still giving you dream imagery. And sometimes that explains uh, voices and stuff. Um Alistair Crowley used to call them atmospherics. Uh, he would say they interfere with meditation because you'd start to meditate and you'd hear a voice or whatever. And he's like, they're just, they're, they're like stray radio waves. Just ignore them. Um, I've had them do like, like the creepiest thing. I think I've had a voice do is I laid down, just got comfortable and a voice whispers in my ear. There's someone in the house. Oh, shit. No, <laughs> and I went. No, there's not. But now I have to check. Yeah. So the voice didn't scare me because I'm used to that part. But a person being in my house that's not supposed to be—that's the scary part. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Oh my gosh. Did I ever tell you about the, the dream that I had? So I had something very similar to you in a dream, but I also had something kind of similar when I was falling asleep. I was still awake. Um, but I was trying to fall asleep and this like man's voice in my ear goes, wake up. And I was yeah. just like, oh, hell no. And I like turned and yelled at it. But um, <laughs> in a dream, I, I knew I was dreaming. So it was a lucid dream. And I hear this woman and she says, Lynn, wake up. Someone is behind you. Wake up. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I woke up and was like, ah. didn't see anyone behind me. Right. But it was very creepy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have uh, I have little wise cams all over my house and property now, uh, and occasionally they catch weird things. And I think the weirdest one related to that, I was actually outside <clears throat> walking toward my house. I had just come home, and uh, I, I kept the video of this. So I hear this loud crash, bang, and I'm like, and I look at the the room it kind of came from from the outside. I'm like, what the hell was that? And I thought maybe it. It might have come from the neighbors and just floated over the house and sounded like it came from the house. And I came in, I didn't see anything. I was like, all right. And then I came back and I realized the candle that was on the end of the bookshelf had fallen and hit the heater. Oh, wow. So there's like baseboard heating. So it hit it and that just made an enormous amount of noise because it was a heavy glass candle. And I was like, oh, well, that's weird. And so I picked it up and I put it up. And a little while later, I pulled up the wise cam and I went back. And you hear very distinct footsteps that get louder as they come into the room and finally the candle falls off the shelf. <laughs> Some jackass was messing with your candle. And, and, my, and what my were you smoking? <laughs> and my roommate and I tried to replicate it and even stomping, we could not get that level of noise of like boom, boom, boom. And then like... I think it was the following weekend. We I, I have a performance space for bands here. The band's out there playing. 
and my roommate and the sound guy's girlfriend are standing or sitting there and they hear footsteps coming from that room and they thought it was me and they turned and there's nobody there. And they're both like, okay, stop with the footsteps. <laughs> yeah. That would be creepy hearing like footsteps walking up on you, but wow. That's interesting. Well, be before I retired, I, I was a curator at the Pacific Aviation Museum in Pearl Harbor in a hangar 79 and actually hangar 37 at night when the place is totally abandoned and maybe you're the only person there you can hear people talking mm -hmm. I bet and, and they, they say that's the, the dead that was lost you know on december 7th and things get things move we've had videos watching something all of a sudden you know something something will, will move in one of the mannequins or something will be sitting there and all of a sudden it will shift mm -hmm. and that's freaky yeah yeah and there's no, I mean, there's no, there's no explanation for it other than uh, maybe the place is haunted. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, and I mean, maybe hauntings are also the fact that we don't understand time. Mm. You know, there, there have been people who have witnessed ghosts who are people who are still alive. Yes. And you I often wonder if we seem like ghosts to the ghosts. Right, right. Like we're interfacing with another time period yeah. or even another plane of existence. And they're going, what is that? Why does yeah. that keep happening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I have wondered that too. That's that's a fascinating idea. I, I, I had a short film idea I've never done where these ghost hunters walk into a house that's supposed to be severely haunted. And at some point, this portal starts opening up and a knife comes out and... and kills one of them just comes flying through the portal yeah and like a year later they go back and they, they have the knife and they're gonna attack whatever this thing was and the portal starts to open again and they throw the knife and then they see themselves a year ago on the other side of the portal oh no <laughs> that's clever <laughs> no thank you <laughs> i have, I have also, enough yeah I also like the idea because when you think about it, where did the knife come from? They got the knife from the portal and then they threw the knife through the portal. True. So where did the knife come from? Right. <laughs> but they had it for a year, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Enzo, how's it going? Yay, yeah. Enzo's in the house. Yeah. So what do you think about like, so with the UFO phenomena, I'm always curious too, if there's some sort of, I mean, a, a lot of people talk about consciousness in, in, involved with UFOs and UFO communications, so things such as like CE5. Do you think that that could also be um, our own sort of projection when we're doing CE5 as opposed to an oh, actual certainly. ship? I mean, UFOs may also be plasma consciousness, so we may be interacting with something that is normally in our environment, but not in a way we can interact with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So would that be a being? Uh, possibly, yeah. Yeah, it would be like cos conscious plasma. And plasma can look like metal. It can be saucer-shaped. There's so much with plasma. Uh, Andrew Collins wrote a book a few years ago called Light Quest, that covers the, the the complexities of it. And I don't think it explains everything, but it, I think it's definitely a piece of the puzzle. Interesting. I think you got a lot of stuff going on with UFOs. I don't think there's any yeah. one thing. And of course, nowadays, it's so hard to know what's our technology and what's not. I mean, because we have so much advanced technology and it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And who knows what corporations and governmental agencies have that we we have we won't know about for 20 years. So I think anything now is kind of like, well, is it weird or is it really just one of ours that we don't know about? Well, I mean, and I've said this almost in every broadcast I've been on with Lynn and, and anybody else. I was, a, I was, I can't say a dear friend, but I was a, uh, a loyal uh, communicator with Ben Rich, the uh, former president of the Lockheed Skunk Works. He was Kelly Johnson's right-hand man. And just before he died, I was talking to him at USC Medical Center and he said, Jim, we have things out in the desert. He wasn't referring to Area 51. We have things out in the desert that's 50 years beyond what you can comprehend. And I can comprehend a hell of a lot. <laughs> and if you see movies like Star Wars or Star Trek, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. Right. I mean, that really op that opens up Pandora's box of, you know, of what really, what, 
what kind of technology do we have? Yes. Yeah. And now one thing I've, I've mentioned to a, a number of uh, UFO types is if it has a red and green light on each on either side of it, it's man-made. I don't think I don't think UFOs are going to adhere to you know, to international and 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 FA requirements of having <laughs> anti-collision beacons on their on their flying saucers. So it's uh, so that's yeah, it's one of the telltales you can look at and say, yeah. well, maybe oh, yeah. maybe it's maybe it's not. Um, there, but there's like like Ben said, if if you've if you've seen it in, in Star Wars or Star Trek or those types of movies, we we have that technology. We've been there, done that. I, I also, um, well, first of all, John Keel mentions a number of accounts because you make a good point. I mean, if it, if it has the standard running lights and stuff, but John Keel mentions a number of accounts of like airplanes that people will cite mm. and they're flying very low to the ground. They're flying too slow for an airplane and they're not making any noise, but they look like an airplane. Uh, so, I mean, this stuff could potentially emulate our stuff, but it seems like there would be a giveaway at some point. Hmm. Yeah. 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 See, to me, that would be tough because then it would be like, well, is it a glider that just looks like an airplane from where the right. person right. well, this, this stuff apparently did things that, that gliders and stuff couldn't do. Hmm. Interesting. And, and I've heard a number of stories of, of, of things like that over the years, like people have witnessed that have told me personally, and they're like, I don't know, it was like the plane was just standing still in the air. Mm. In today's world with, with the, the drones that we can go, you know, you and I can go out and buy, yeah. and some of them can be very, very large. Uh, there was a, someone had one they put together, and there was like 100 drones that were all interconnected, and they were up in the air doing yeah. artwork, whatever. 20 years ago, that technology didn't exist. Mm. And you see well, some of these, some of this movement, you know, going on uh, that you would see with a man-made uh, little drone, you know, a yeah. remote controlled drone. Uh, but 20 years ago, that, that wasn't the case. I mean, I can, that, I can say, okay, this is probably man-made just where the way it's flying and whatever. Uh, but well, back then you, you'd have to look at it with a, a different set of eyes. Well, 20 years ago, it would have been classified. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anything we have that we can buy in the store has been around 30, 40 years in, yep. in yep. you know, classified circles. Yeah, I know uh, back when the first shuttle launch went up when uh, that was, it was Columbia. Was Columbia the first one or was it uh, Challenger? Whatever the first one going up. They didn't. Challenger. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, they didn't know if they had any damage on the tiles. Now they're, you know, they're they went 185 miles or whatever it was. Yeah. And they were very concerned. They didn't have uh, 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 EV capabilities yet. Now, they weren't going to try it. It was the first launch. So the Air Force tuned in and he said, you have to take my word for it, but there's no damage to the, to the heat tiles on the shuttle. He said... Uh, in this position, there's a chip. It's about three quarters of an inch long, and uh, it's a corner chip. It shouldn't affect anything. And they went through and they they more or less mapped out the bottom of what they said were the chips and, and cracks and a little bit of damage. And NASA said, "Well, this is 1981." They said, "Well, how do you know?" And he said, "You're going to have to trust me. You know, this is the this is fact. This is not fiction. This is fact." That's what 40 years ago. Yeah, they had, I mean, they, and this that was a that was ground based imagery into space. Now, our 2.1 meter telescope at uh, Kitt Peak uh, used adaptive optics and it had the same resolution and the same clarity, you know, pretty much as Hubble. And they shot a UV laser up in the sky, and, and 1200 times a second, it would it would adjust the uh, uh, the secondary mirror going to the spectrograph or going to the cameras to sharpen the thing up. Hmm. Fortunately, in Southern Arizona, we have uh, the air above us is, is, is not very turbulent and it's very, very clear. That's why we go outside in almost anywhere you look up, you'll see the stars are twinkling here. They don't twinkle. <laughs> right. Right. Cause the air is too clear. And you mentioned earlier, dark matter. We have no we know dark matter is out there. We have absolutely no idea what it is. You can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, you can't smell it. And right now we can't measure it. 
I, I see. I don't think it's out there. I think that that we're we're looking at dark matter to explain something that we you know we don't want to give up a dogma about. Hmm. But I think there are electrical uh, models that work way better than the dark matter models, and we're slowly getting there. You know, like sl little baby step by baby step. Yeah. Well, on, at the male uh, four meter telescope on Kitt Peak. Uh, starting in uh, 2018, they had an $85 million project where they were going to put a, uh, they were going to take the secondary mirror off and put up a spectrograph mm -hmm. with, adju with adjustable heads. And they were going to scan the northern hemisphere, the northern sky, um, every three days. And they're, you know, they're looking, they're looking for changes of state. They're, you know, they're looking at redshift. They're looking at all sorts of right. things. And I haven't been up there since it's been operational because I, uh, my knees, my knees wouldn't allow me to go walking up and down to, uh, at 7,000 feet. Right. Uh, you know, uh, it's, and it's uphill both ways. I mean, you come down and you have to go back up. So no matter where you did, you're going uphill <laughs> and that's always hell on the, yeah, on the, uh, on the knees. But it was really fascinating because they had uh, uh, a, tr you know, they, a tremendous amount of, of effort has been put into both you know, the uh, male telescope, and they have a, a uh, an identical one in Chile. It's a four meter. It, it, when they built the two of them, they were you know, the only telescope larger was was uh, Mount Palomar. But the mm -hmm. one that's going to be exciting, you know, uh, not counting the space based telescope like the James Webb telescope, right? is the giant Magellan telescope that should get first light sometime this year or early next year. And they use seven 27 foot diameter mirrors as their primary mirror. Mm. Wow. And they, they think they're going to be able to look back to within a hundred thousand years of first light. Hmm. And where's that one going to be located in Chile? Chile. Okay. Yeah. It's up, it's 200 miles from the closest city and it's at 16,500 feet. Nice. I mean, yeah, you almost have to you, use oxygen when you're up there, and <laughs> and, and all the, you know, all the room, all the control, everything is down the mountain away is where the you know, where the air is a little bit uh, thicker, right, where they, right, where they can awesome. breathe, yeah. And there, and then they have the giant synopsis telescope, which is, uses two 27 foot diameter mirrors, and it takes a picture of the southern sky every 48 hours, and it's looking for changes of state, anything that's moved in the last 48 hours or yeah. whatever. And uh, that all that stuff was was really fascinating because when you look up, uh, I think the, the average the average set of eyes and the average location, the most stars you can see are about nine thousand on a mm. crystal clear mm. night. Wow! And you look at some of this some of the uh, images now from uh, wet, uh, the uh, oh, yeah. James Webb Telescope, and it, it is it is almost white. I mean, it's 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 yeah. it, it's a textured image. But all that texture is all stars and galaxies. Yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely mind-boggling. And apparently, apparently they found something uh, just last week or so that they can't explain because they felt that real early galaxies really had no form; they were mm -hmm. sort of abstract. And they're they they're looking at one they know is is thirteen four billion years light years away, and it's it's a it has uh, shape and, and form to it that they didn't expect to see. And it changes their idea on the mm -hmm. nature and the for, of the formation of the galaxies in the early. Hmm. So, but I, I mean, I, all, I, of it, all of it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I lean a little more toward the idea of a steady state universe rather than one that was created by the big bang. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what this stuff is showing mm -hmm. is like the further we look out there, the, for, the further the time goes back because we're like, Oh, well that shouldn't be there. That yeah. shouldn't be there. Yeah. But if we're in a steady state, <laughs> you're going to you're see a McDonald's <laughs> sign back there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, and just like, it's just like artifacts around the world. Like they keep digging stuff mm -hmm. up and dates keep getting older. And it's yeah. like, and yet you don't want to accept there could have been another civilization out there prior to ours. And, yeah. there, it, it's, and there's, there's some scientists or archaeologists are saying that the Sphinx may be between 20 and 200,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, Robert Schock was the, the mm -hmm. geologist who looked at that initially. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he uh, conservatively said 5,000 BC initially. Mm -hmm. Then he put it to 12. 
uh, because it lines up with Leo on the horizon at 12,500 years, which is also the the Egyptian first time, Zeptepe, and the end of the last ice age. Hmm. So it would have been the end of the cataclysmic end of, of the Younger Dryas period. So with all those numbers lining up, Shock said 12,500 BC is likely when they plotted out the Sphinx. Okay. Wow. But it could have gone a whole cycle before that. I think Robert Bavall pushes it to like 30,000 years old. How do they how did how did they come to the uh, and I and I didn't dig into it, but the, you know the the number 200,000 years. That old. that one I don't know. It's unlikely that with the weathering, it's unlikely to be that old. I mean, what Shock discovered is the weathering. It could have been buried. It could have been buried. It could have. That's that is true. What Shock discovered is the the damage to the Sphinx that Egyptologists were saying was wind erosion was actually centuries of rain erosion. Mm -hmm. And that's when he said, "Okay, well, if it's a rain erosion, how far do we have to go back to get rain? And you have to go back quite a distance." And and yeah. they. When I talked to him, I think the first time he was saying that they are Egyptologists anyway, literally spit on him for for making these discoveries. That's crazy because they have their timeline. He was like, well, I got you something new. Look at this. And they're right. like, we don't want something new. We already have it figured out. Yeah. And uh, don't confuse me with facts. My mind's, my mind's made up. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of them actually said your facts conflict with our theories. So. Your facts must be wrong. Uh, the the other famous quote was someone asked him where are the, where are the pottery shards from this these people that would have built it that long ago, and then not long after that we dig up Gobekli Tepe, which isn't that far away, and uh, Robert's like, well, there you go, you got you got your pottery shards, mm -hmm. because here's a civilization that, a civilization that could build Gobekli Tepe, Gobekli Tepe could build the Sphinx very easily. Yeah. yeah. And it dates to the same time period. It's amazing. It's absolutely oh, yeah. amazing. But it's it's the hubris of it all, you know, that like it kills me. It's just like, no, 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 we have our dates. We're good. Thank you so much. Move well, along. You yeah. know, with, like like with anything, it gets complicated because the, mm -hmm. the people who live in Egypt now want that to be part of their culture. Right. And if you put the further you put it back, you don't, we don't know who was there then, if, if they're even connected to the people who inhabit Egypt now. Right. Um, plus archaeologists, Egyptologists and stuff. I mean, they, they need that funding. They need that funding money. If, and if, if it's found out that everything they've been saying is wrong, well, why would we continue to fund them? Right. Well, to find out what is actually true. Right. You yes, More you would funding. think. <laughs> More funding needed, I would think. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. It is interesting, but there's a lot of civilizations around the world that are like that, and 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 here in the in North America too. There's definitely um, things that we're finding archaeological sites. You know, when oh, yeah. they think, well, oh, nobody should have been here. I mean, even the um, even in recent history, uh, when you know North America was discovered, uh, you know, we are led to believe that it was a very primitive. Um, the North or the Native Americans were a very primitive society, but in reality, yeah. it was a very advanced society, and it yeah. was a huge society. Especially when you go down to Mesoamerica and South America. I mean, these were advanced societies. There was I can't remember which one it was. Um, I don't know if it was Teotihuacan, but one of them I, at the time was bigger than Paris, you know, or more populated yeah. than Paris. And yep. so it's just like, why are we being told that these were primitive societies that they came to? They well, were initially, it's it's because there's a white centric oh, yeah. sort of view of things, a European centric view. They came in, they had their society, which by default was better than the society that was there because they had guns and they had mm -hmm. ships. And these people had a different type of technology and yeah. had different types of culture. So they were clearly inferior. Right. <laughs> and it's only now that we're starting to realize while well, some of these these quote inferior cultures could do stuff we can't even today yeah you know That's these tough. building projects are amazing the way they used sound technology is amazing and we're only now starting to discover some of that mm -hmm. yeah i mean even things like basic things like um oh what's the word i'm looking for where you where they had like like plumbing 
You yeah, know, oh, whereas yeah. Yeah, yeah. in European countries, it was disgusting. It was yes. just like throw it into the street, you know, like toss <laughs> yeah, it out. Yeah. Hey, watch out, guys. Uh, well, heads up. And there's stuff like Terra Preta down in South mm -hmm. America, which is this incredibly rich uh, soil that continually mm -hmm. renews itself. It's it's amazing, and you have all these 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 arch these archaeologists and these these geologists trying to figure out how this stuff came about naturally, when the real answer is probably that these people knew how to make it. Yeah. And that there was a huge thriving culture there that they're slowly now starting to acknowledge that the the Amazon was one gigantic thriving culture at one point very far back absolutely what, what, ca what caused it to, what caused it to end sickness um, from disease we, we caused some of you know the europeans caused some of it coming in mm -hmm. um but i think there were other factors like just environmental factors that slowly yeah. changed things i mean global yeah. warming global warming global cooling <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the environment is always changing. I mean, we've been we've been on a warming streak since mm -hmm. the early 1800s now. I think. Yeah, it's cyclic. I mean, the entire solar system is warming up right now. Yes. So it's yeah. but, but it, it 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 all goes in cycles. I mean, exactly. there's been yeah. periods at multiple periods of time in in the last 2,000 years that have been much hotter than yeah. it is today, and, and much much colder too. And much colder. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of that's related to solar activity. Some of it could be related to galactic activity because we're being bombarded by stuff all the time. Uh, and plus, the, the Earth just has these natural cycles in the way that moves. That's true. Yeah. I think and you have volcanic true. activity and you have all this other stuff. I mean, there's so many factors. Yeah. I have no doubt that, that we play a part in those factors mm -hmm. uh, because everything part. affects. Yeah, exactly. It's a small part. I, fi I figure the way I look at it is like, if we're going to clean things up, that's a win-win situation. Even if it's not contributing to global warming, it's still cleaning the environment, which is a plus. Right. Not a bad thing. Right. The but only people who don't like that are the big corporations who are going to right. lose money <laughs> if they have to clean up their act. True. Well, I, yeah, but and, and India and China are two of the biggest polluters. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And yet, in, every, in, 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 in the industrial world, the only countries that aren't having their feet put to the fire for reducing their emissions are China and India. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, well, that's because that's where all the cheap labor is. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. You know, it's interesting too, though, speaking kind of about uh, Colombian times, uh, which I even hate that term, but um, there it's what's really interesting. I, I was reading, there's a book called 1491. Have you read it? Sarai, no. you would probably love it. Um, I can't remember the author off the top of my head. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, but he's ta he talks about, he's done a lot of, he was a journalist, but he did a lot of research into this um, kind of these pre-Columbian uh, societies and what it was really like back then. And one of the things that they discovered was that the Native Americans, one of the things they were really adept at was agriculture. And so yeah. they used to, there was a lot of deforestation. So we have these ideas that, you know, North America was just lush, like forest. But actually what they did is they burned a lot of it. They, you know, cut down a lot of the trees. So a lot of it was grasslands. Um, yeah. And they, they purposefully created these. Like, so they were terraforming this environment to to create it one for um insect control and two but also also for um agriculture and you know their animals and such uh, i can't remember all the different reasons but um but they knew how to do it in balance yeah and it was really really interesting um oh stewart's read it um, but one of the things they found that helped them kind of understand how much burning they were doing was they were looking at um, the soil and the amount of carbon in the soil um, based on other time periods. And right. during right. those time periods, there was a much higher level, even higher than there is today, level of carbon in the soil. Mm -hmm. Really, really fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's not simple. And, and the problem is, like you're saying, China and India pollute an enormous amount. Uh, but also they, they, they're putting like these corporate entities are kind of putting it on people like, oh, people need to do this stuff. And it's yeah, like it's it's a little bit. But when they're pumping tons of pollutants in, you know, like even if everyone recycled and everyone did all this green stuff, yeah. it's still not going to fix anything until the corporate entities fix what they're doing until India and China fix what they're doing until we stop the Amazon from being clear cut, which is probably one of the biggest triggers for any kind of d environmental damage. I mean, it's our lungs. 
Yeah, exactly. But the, but also, the, the way well, that what they do though is they try to switch it to the individual. Well, people need to do do this, but we're not. We can't do this. Like it's great if we if we recycle if we use you know better stuff that's cleaner that's fantastic. Solar yes. panels are great, but it's not going to fix the environmental damage that's being done. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And like it's it's fascinating, and and it kind of I mean this could lead into a whole like bigger conversation about the economy and and what's going on right now. But um, what's real? I know, sorry, Jim. Uh, but like one of the things that kills me is the um and yes thank you david hurley my husband so clever the oceans too yes the oceans also need a lot well, of attention they're yeah. the biggest victim in the pollution uh the yeah oceans, game. yes oh i mean the things that we do to our ocean is horrible absolutely horrible mm -hmm. um but oh, he was saying i think he heard that they're trying to pass a law in california um that everybody has to have a an electric car what is it by 2025 or something absolutely 2035 crazy? they they will ban the sale of new gas powered automobiles That's you'll so still be able to buy used gas powered automobiles yeah so but but today i mean i'm talking about today you know the uh what's the 12th of uh of, of september, september 2022 yeah. State of California made the announcement that you're not. We don't want you to charge your your electric vehicle between these hours because the grid can't handle it. Yeah, <laughs> and they're talking up. They're talking about brownouts and blackouts, and they want to put 25 million people onto the grid that can't handle four <laughs> or five per neighborhood. That's so crazy! Oh my god. And not only yeah. that, but when, when you're looking at some of this stuff like electricity, a lot of it's still being generated by things like coal. Coal, thank you. So it's like, great, you're using an electric car, but that electric car is using more electricity, which is creating more burning coal, which is causing more pollutants. And right. what and how much energy was expelled creating, uh, digging up the lithium batteries? Yes. Yes, yes. I forget too. how many how many hundreds of tons of ore for one small battery, I mean, less than a pound of lithium. Yeah. I mean, it's just... Uh, and the parts that come from all yeah. over the world that have to all yeah. be shipped together, yeah. um, shipped from different areas of the world, which, of course, uses more gas from the cargo ships and the pollutants that it puts into the air. Yeah, it's just, it's it's crazy. It's Again, it's it's just a a hey look over here while they keep doing the same stuff they've always been doing, right? You know, it's it's, it's you as an individual who's at fault. No, <laughs> it's it's really not. Yeah, my yeah. question is, what's in it for them? Like, what's with the big push for electric cars? There's got to be something in it for them. Well, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. Sure, because people are profiting from it. Uh -huh. I mean, and, there's there's always going to be profit in this type of stuff, and it's just a matter of who's in control and who can who can profit from it. Yep, my husband yep. likes you. Thank you, Soraya. He said, <laughs> 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 "Yep, absolutely." But they're already profiting profiting off of oil. So why we got to like why switch to electric? Well, because okay. different different people are going to profit off the electric. <laughs> That's true, and I guess the oh. oil people are still going to profit too. Oh, yeah. but even even some of the environmental weenies out there are now saying, well, maybe nuclear isn't so bad. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Nuclear is great until we have a meltdown. True. Not so great. Well, <laughs> we, there's there's you know, they, they had an accident at Three Mile Island. No you know, no one lost their life that we yes, know luckily. of. Uh Chernobyl, that was just Russian stupidity. Yeah. <laughs> and I uh, mean the, the one in Japan was is still bad. Um mm -hmm. But that was from the earthquake. And I mean, you're in an earthquake zone and you have a nuclear reactor. Yeah. Maybe we and, want to find And their backup there. generators were all susceptible to flooding. Yeah. With oh, the gosh. tsunami. And that's what uh, yeah. And that's gonna that's gonna be a, a, a area that's written off for the rest of eternity. Yeah, pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What about wind? You never hear anything are, about wind. There's plenty of wind in this planet. No, there isn't. Hey, I don't care. I don't care what. I mean, every you know, anybody who has a, a a logical brain, not a, an environmental wacko brain or whatever it is, um, if you're going to go to renewable uh, energy, wind, solar, whatever, 
Yeah, that can that cannot comprise more than fifty percent total uh, electrical generation capabilities because you know what they're having problems right now in in Europe, and they're going to freeze. The, you know, they may they may come to an end in Europe this winter because they can't rely on wind because it doesn't always blow. Right. Or if it blows too hard, oh, we got to shut the thing. We got to put the vanes into the wind, and we can't generate. If it's too cold. Uh, the wind turbines don't work very well. Uh, the oil gets stiff, uh, and 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 same with solar. If if it's overcast, if it's winter months, and you're in the northern latitudes, how in the hell that's going to uh, help you? Well, uh, the only so one that's the only ones that's constant that doesn't change dramatically are your uh, using the tides for yes. uh, except and, geo you know, and geothermal yeah. stuff as well, but all. But, you know, I live in upstate New York, and I know a number of people now who have gotten very good solar panels put on their houses yeah. and have not paid a drop of electric since they've had them up. And it's been years. Nice. So, I mean, we get enough sun that the, if you have enough solar panels, it will collect in those batteries. And yeah. it they're, they're just not using them. They're not people who are only running like two things. They're people who are running a lot of stuff. And they're like, yeah, I have no electric bill anymore. That's crazy. Yeah. That's nice. You just have to afford the expense of getting them put on in the first place. And they right. and they have a finite life expectancy. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, everything does. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We actually have a lot of wind turbines out here, but I'm also right on the coast. Uh, yeah. So like the town that I live in, we actually have our own um, like electric plant or facility. Um, and there's tons of wind turbines around. So and by tons, I mean two. Um, so a bit of an exaggeration <laughs> there. <laughs> I mean, do, do, you realize that the environmental cost to building one of the just one of these big, huge wind turbines? I don't know, but I can tell you whatever the cost was, it offset the cost that I pay in my utility bills because moving here to this town, um, my utility is so much cheaper than hmm. paying one of the big companies that we had to pay in the other town that I lived in. So much cheaper. It's like almost half the price. Yeah. Well, that's a plus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's still expensive now. Don't get me wrong. It's doubled lately. Uh, but <laughs> a lot still, of things have. Yeah. I can't imagine yeah. what it be, would be if I still lived in the other town I was in. So, so the, the, the uh, well, but I just lost it. Never mind. <laughs> oh, I'm not the only one. Thank, thank you. I'm glad you <laughs> lost it. Whatever it was, <laughs> it'll, it'll come back in an unexpected moment. Oh yeah, it, it always does. I mean, I'll, you know, someone will ask me a question, and I, and I know I have the answer. It's up there somewhere, but for the life of me, I can't think of it. You know, and, and ten minutes later, as I'm as I'm walking out the door, ah, that was the answer. And <laughs> it's like we have different platters of information on our brain. You can remember the stuff that's on the same platter, but if it's on another platter, you got to figure out how to get there before you'll remember it. <laughs> the, the, the way I look at it, I'm seventy seven. And the way I look at memory and recovery, you know, retrieving stuff from memory. When you're born, you have an empty four drawer filing cabinet. Yeah. And every memory you have, everyone, you put in a file folder, memory number one. And pretty soon, all you know, that four drawer filing cabinet is filled up. Now we got another one. By the time you're my age, it's like Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, and, you know, and, you know it's 13 square miles of warehouse. Oh and God. somewhere, you know, two miles down this way and a mile and a half down that way and up six levels, there's an area where I know the information is stored. And that's why it takes so long. I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think I think it's a good analogy as far as trying to remember stuff. Yeah. yeah. I do know what I was going to say. I've been hearing rumblings more and more about cold fusion again. Hmm. Which would be interesting if they can make it work substantially. Mm -hmm. Lockheed, in my in uh, my book, The 75 Years of Lockheed Skunk Works, one of the chapters is their cold fusion reactor. Huh. And uh, when, I, when the book was sent off to my publisher, uh, I think they were in version five, and I think they're in version eight right now, or, or revision eight. And the goal is they're getting they're, they're getting very, very close. It is using non-radioactive depleted, I think depleted uranium, I believe is the is the power. It cannot be used for a dirty bomb. It cannot uh, do a meltdown. 
and it requires no maintenance and yet it's good for 20 years right what what the end goal is is to have an air transportable power plant that you can put into a C130 or a C1 uh, a C, a C17 or a C5 or even you know uh, some of the uh, you know foreign you know the uh, the A400 but it's a 40 standard 40 foot container you put it on a you know you go to the Saudi frontier you can you can get up uh, 100 feet off the ground in a in a helicopter and do a 360 degree loop and you can't see anything but tabletop flat mm -hmm. you need to put a post you know you know some type of post out there you drop this thing this this thing off it requires little or no maintenance and it's it will be designed to power a city or a town of 100,000 people nice wow with no pollution, uh, no 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 heat heat signature, uh, it's all self-contained. The other thing that it could be used for, and I think possibly that's where they're going, if they can, they keep. When computers first came out, they were huge, and in every 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 change in technology, they kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I remember when Control Data canceled their Centurion project; it was the size of two big, huge refrigerators. It was a one megabyte hard drive. <laughs> it would cost over a million dollars. Right. Now, now you can get a micro thumb drive, yeah. SD card with a half a terabyte. You can go to Best Buy and pay, buy it for under a hundred dollars or maybe $120 for 500 gigabytes of, of storage. Yep. It's crazy. So it's just it's just a matter of time until they can start, you know, com compacting that down. And when they get to a point where it's you know it's it's been proven, it's it's working right. You you need the right type of motors. You you take a section of the uh, uh, cargo area of a jumbo jet. You put this in there, and you have specially designed and, and built electric motors or fans to replace the turbo fans and turbo jets. You can go up there in a 747 size airplane and fly around the world for eternity <laughs> and you never have to land. But the thing is it has to be profitable and it's not going to come to fruition in, in our general culture unless it's profitable. I mean, look at, look at Tesla. Tesla had methods of delivering free energy to everybody. And when the electric companies realized, Oh, you, you just want to give it away? No, yeah. no, you're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and where did where did they rat hole all that technology? Exactly. Exactly. It's and probably. You know the, you're going. Oh, go I was just going to say, and what what kills me, kind of like, and, and I'm curious about is so all of the you know the planning and the issues and everything that we're having to get ready to go to the moon again, mm -hmm. again, um, it's questionable. But regardless, we went to the moon in 1969 on these giant computers, which now are cell phones have more processing power, yeah. right? Um, A million times more processing us. power. Yeah. yeah. We were able to go then. Why is it so difficult? Why does it require so much planning? We already have the technology that could take us there. Big. Like, so you can't tell me we don't have something better than that at this point. What's like, why do they keep pushing it out? Why are they having so many issues? Because they're, they're covering their butt. Yeah. Oh God, we can't, we can't have a failure. I mean, the only way you learn is through failure. That's why they have flight tests. They have category one, two, and three flight testing for aircraft and they'll lose an aircraft or they, they sometimes they'll lose a life uh, in that endeavor. But that's where you, yeah, that's where you, you work out the, you know, the wrinkles, you know, in the system. Um, and, and the, the moon's a mystery all unto itself as well, because realistically, we have no idea how the moon got where it is or what what it really was formed for. There's no theory that actually works. Yeah. Um, well, how about we the collision of a, a collision of another planet, and it that's the remnants that were thrown off of the Earth. That's the one that they're sticking with, but I do know there's there's like two different issues that they can't explain to make that work. Yeah. Um, I because th I think it needs a double smack is what it needed. Like like it needs one to knock the stuff free and another to put it in Earth's orbit. 
Right. And, and to be in a, um, a, 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 I don't know, a fixed orbit. So it doesn't yeah. rotate itself because the one, the moon, proportionally speaking, is way too large yes. to be sucked in by our gravity. And two, not orbiting or not rotating itself is extremely unusual. So you and have all of these weird things. Well, Mercury also, doesn't, Mercury doesn't rotate either. I mean, it's always, there's always the same size always facing the sun. True. True. Yeah. Well, the That's other thing about the moon, though, is it's so big and it's also hollow, mm. which is something we haven't been able to explain either, which is okay. where you get the theory that it's an artificial satellite. Yeah. That the fact that it rang like a bell when they dropped something on it. Yeah. Yeah, that was a little weird. <laughs> but, you know, now they know, hey, there's helium-3 there. We can use this. We can make money off of this. Let's go back to the moon. Oh, uh, that's why now. I yeah. it, it doesn't make sense to me that we never went back to the moon. I always wondered, like, mm, that's why I, th I go I back. Think, I think someone told us not to come back. It's possible. That, or they've been going all along. Well, Met according to what, Edward Mitchell and, and a few of the other astronauts said that they were observed when they were on yes. the moon. That's yeah, true. there's people saying they never went, but I think that would be a hard. That, I think that would be a hard one to to fake. Yeah, I may be. I may be wrong. I have been a couple of times. Right. I have I have an FX wives that to, to, to certify <laughs> that that I could be wrong from time to time. <laughs> no, no one's right all the time. We all make mistakes. We all, you yeah. know, think wrong things. There's the, and there's no absolute truth anyway. I mean, there, yeah. there's variations. There's perspectives and interpretations and stuff. I mean, I'm fairly, I'm fairly sure we went to the moon. Mm. You know, I, I don't see reason to think we didn't. Um, yeah. Just like I'm, I'm 99.999% sure the earth is not flat. Yeah. Yep. yep. And it's really not that hard to prove, which is why it's amazing that that has caught on like it has. Right. <laughs> yeah. There's a psychological, like explanation behind that i'm still trying to figure out right. what it is but there's something <laughs> it's well i think i think it stems from the fact that we have been lied to so much by our government oh, and our oh no tell me that's not true oh, <laughs> exactly. oh that, my god i just that people, <laughs> uh, that i don't people. know if i can live knowing that i mean it's just it's just one of the saddest <laughs> things i've ever heard you know, our government would lie to us. I know it's Those shocking. rotten ass bastards. How could you say something like and that? Not just our government, but all the governments. <laughs> <laughs> and the news, because those are just propaganda machines now. Yes. Um, yep. But, you know, I think you got people who got so, so sick of that, that they're, they're literally questioning everything right down to is, is the earth even round? Were we lied to about that? Yeah. Um, Adam Go rightly says that there was this was actually implanted you, as David. disinfo yeah. back in um in the early 80s, I think, at some UFO conference. And it took a long time for it to eventually come through, and then suddenly you start you saw it start showing up. But there was a religious, there's been a religious flat earth society that I think has existed since like the mid 1800s or something like that. The mid 1800s, I could see maybe, a, maybe. A oh, but it existed. It, I don't think it ever completely faded out. We found out about it at the end of the 90s hmm. and we, we pretended to have a representative of the flat earth society on my music show. Hmm. And uh, he he went and studied up on it and came in like it like an old time Southern preacher and it was hilarious. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, and we're, and we're thinking, you know, like people don't even know about this. This is such so ridiculous. And then ten years later, there are people seriously saying the Earth is flat, and it's like, what's wrong with reality? What's going on here? Well, if if, if you if you live in Kansas or Nebraska or North or South Dakota, North Dakota, that's a valid <laughs> statement. <laughs> True, true. There does I've not been be there. Yeah. Of any yeah. kind. It's but yeah. the, I will I will give the flat earth people this. They give the best insults. So I oh, had this certainly. old podcast a while back, several years back, with two friends of mine, and we did an episode on flat earth. And I can't repeat on YouTube a lot of the things we were called, <laughs> but they were amazing. <laughs> we were rolling. Yeah. Like what? well, hey, if you, if it was a flat earth. And we have a, a a lunar eclipse. That means the the Earth is blocking the uh, light that's illuminating the moon. 
And it should be just a straight bar across there, not a circular uh, yeah. thing as it's going yeah. across. What's the light so, bulb? We're blocking. We're blocking the light bulb somehow. I yeah, there is an explanation for it. I can't remember what it is. Yeah, so. uh, well, it's an interesting. It's an interesting. It's an interesting group. We would, be, we would be the only the only one uh the only planet that's not a ball. I don't well think the so. argument is those aren't planets. Right. <laughs> those Christmas aren't planets, planets, those aren't stars. There, there's a whole we're in like a fishbowl kind of situation. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Flat Earthers from yes, we have yeah, flat earthers across the globe. Yeah, that's, that, yep. That was actually it. one of their tweets. It was, yes, it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, but but I I do think it comes down to a distrust of authority. It's just an yeah. extreme reaction to that distrust of authority, which is, you know, distrusting yeah, authority is a very legitimate thing yeah yeah because they lie they, they even if they don't need to they're going to swing it to make it better for them even if they even if they don't have to lie about something it's still going to get spun to their advantage yeah 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 oh speaking about lying and those rat you know those rats there in the, in the, the pentagon the navy has said that effective immediately uh, no UFO imagery will be released yeah. by the United States Navy because it's classified. It, it affects national security. Now, now, if we didn't build them, if we're not flying them, how in the hell can it be affect national security? We should all be, a, you know, we should all be out there looking and making sure that uh, uh, the powers that be know, you know, know where, you know, where, where the enemy is if they're the enemy. I mean, it's just. And I and I and I agree with uh, uh, Stephen Greer when it, Dr. Greer uh, when he, when he says that he believes that aliens that are out there aren't you know they're not a threat to us because if they were we would already know it. Hmm. I'm, I mean, I'm not I'm not convinced the UFO phenomena as we know it is actually alien in origin. Hmm. I, th I, I think we're not alone, we're, huh? We're not alone. No, I am. I mean, we, we just talked about how 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 vast the universe is. I am <laughs> sure there's tons of life out there. I am sure there's probably life in our own solar system. I just don't know that we would recognize other intelligent life if it wasn't just like us. Hmm. I mean, we've had octopi in the seas for all this time, and only now are we going, "Hey, these guys are really smart." Yeah, yeah, that's true. And there could be an alien life form. I mean, they have yeah. little teeth in their right. tentacles and their suction cups. The uh, Can you and imagine though, they'd be like, "Man, we came to this planet and now they eat us. This was a bad yeah. decision." <laughs> and, and there could be stuff deep in the oceans that is intelligent life that is completely different from us that we don't even know is there because we don't really explore it that much. It's only five percent of the ocean's been explored. Yeah. Crazy. So, yeah. I mean, there, I have no doubt there was probably life on Mars at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, there could still be life on Mars somewhere underground. Yeah. Uh, there could be life in places like Jupiter, but it may not be a carbon-based life form. Mm -hmm. Hence, we're not even looking for it. We don't even know how to look for it. Right. So I, th I think life persists everywhere. We look around Earth and we see these extremophiles, things living in the you know Antarctic ice and things living in volcanoes. I mean, life can thrive very easily, apparently, in any condition, but we're looking for stuff like us. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I, I agree. I think that at some point we will realize how much life there actually is out out there uh, yeah. that we just didn't even know how to look for. And again, we, we measure intelligence based on our culture. So mm -hmm. like what we were talking about, Europeans coming into the, yeah. to the Americas, they were like, oh, look at these savages, when in reality, they were probably more civilized than the Europeans. Yeah. But they weren't looking at it that way. And they had the bigger guns. Well, right, they had the guns. Period. And the guns, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we had the, we had the smallpox. Yes, and, yes, and yes. That was, that was and, quite a gift yeah. we passed along, and and quite a few other uh, diseases. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. So, we live in interesting times. Now, I I've, I, I mentioned it with uh, Lynn before, but when I was uh, still at Kitt Peak, the uh, just before I left, we had a gathering of all the astronomers all of the technicians and all the docents. 
And one of the key people from the National Science Foundation was given a talk on exoplanets. So we all, we all met at the University of Arizona at the National Optical Astronomy Observatory headquarters. And uh, the uh, gentleman who spoke, and, I, and for the life of me, I didn't, re I didn't recall his name. I could get it, but I didn't recall it. He said he just returned from a conference on exoplanets from all over the world. It was about a 10-day function. And said using you know, proven mathematical formulas, they calculate for every star in the universe, there's one and a half planets. And that number, they calculate that, that are, there are two billion, that's with a B, two billion Earth-like planets orbiting a similar size brown dwarf star in an inhabitable zone with liquid water. And to quote uh, Carl Sagan's uh, character, Jodie Foster played in uh, Contact, if we're the only ones, what a waste of space. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, that's yeah. just based on our understanding of life. And, yeah. And, and, and if you look at something that Douglas Adams had out there in the Hitchhiker's Guide where these aliens come to Earth and they get eaten by a dog because they're actually really tiny compared to us. <laughs> I mean, we assume they're going to be roughly our size. True. They could be gigantic compared to us or they could be really, really tiny, you know, because size doesn't isn't doesn't say anything about intelligence. True. Very, very true. What do you think of the idea that there might be there might be life up in our upper atmosphere? Oh, that, that's certainly a, a possibility. Hmm. There could be stuff. Well, and I mean, that's that also ties into plasma consciousness and stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, so aerial intelligences that we're just not aware of, not able yeah. to to pinpoint. There's so much that we don't know. I mean, look at the tardigrave. I mean, the little yeah. tardigrave, he withstood, what, the vacuum of space, I think it was, or something crazy. And just oh, fine. Yeah. came back alive. He was just like, hey, what's up, guys? Just went for a ride. Like, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Teeny tiny little thing. But yeah. it's, Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Enzo is thrilled. Uh, okay, Douglas Adams quote. I'm liking Soraya that much more now. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> and yes, Jerry the Waterberry. Yes, the little tardigraves. They're so cute. Um, so you mentioned the Electric Universe, which I am yeah. also a fan of. What do you think of the Electric Universe versus the Plasma Universe? Well, I mean, there's a lot of interconnections there. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're both energy. I mean, yeah, they're both electrical energy to a degree. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I like the the electric universe idea. I don't think they're right about everything, right. but I think they have some substantial things right. And their predictions, uh, like when we went to land on a comet, uh, Walt Thornhill said it ma made this list of predictions. One of them being that there would be a large dis electrical discharge when the probe uh, set down. Mm -hmm. and there was, <laughs> and NASA said. Oh, that was nothing. That was just a camera glitch. And Wall's like, right, right, just a camera glitch. It wasn't an electrical discharge, which is exactly what it looked like. And, you know, everything went out for a second. Um, their predictions have been pretty dead on most of the time. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are some far out aspects to it, like the, the, the whole Saturn uh, as the, our original sun idea. Mm. But the, the basic ideas of, of like the sun being electric, a lot of the uh, stuff that holds the galaxies together being electrical in nature, it works in laboratories. Like they can, they can replicate this. They can make small galaxies in laboratories that function and move just like the galaxies we see in space because electricity like that is scalable. Right. So mm -hmm. if nothing else, it deserves a very serious look, but no one will look at it. And that goes back to the whole Velikovsky thing because Velikovsky is the one that, you know, uh, suggested that Venus was initially a comet hmm. and the scientific establishment didn't like it because it didn't fit their theories. They didn't like it because he was using texts like the Bible to support some of these ideas showing, you know, they're, they're talking about Venus as a comet. And so is this other ancient culture. And, and they're like, that's all mythology. That's not real. And every, uh, Laird Scranton wrote a book back in, uh, 2012 or 2013, um, about Velikovsky. What he did is he took all, I had read, just read uh, Velikovsky's first book and thought, did anyone do work on this to like see, like compared to science now? 
And that's what Laird did. He went and took all the current scientific knowledge about Venus and compared it to what Velikovsky predicted compared to what the scientific establishment predicted back in 1950. And pretty much Velikovsky was right across the board. The scientific establishment was wrong across the board. There's a few things we didn't, that, that we still don't know for sure, but it's like, you look at that and you're like, and yet Velikovsky is a bad name. Like you can't even seriously consider his work, despite the fact that everything he said has turned out to be accurate. Yeah. You know, Carl Sagan did a whole hit job on him. Uh, what was not, and I heard, and I haven't heard, uh, heard anybody that, that said, yeah, I heard the same thing, but Carl Sagan was brought in, uh, in, uh, to the fold as far as, uh, knowing what, knowing that we have, uh, alien, you know, alien craft. Yeah, I don't know. And yeah, you know, we had you know photo photo you know high resolution photographs and and other you know, other stuff. They wanted you know they wanted to show you know, Carl Sagan, and and they said we we can show you that you know we're not alone, and will you, and and if you buy into this, will you, will you help us breaking the news to the general public? And he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Well. So. So there's a story from Jacques Vallée's, uh, his Forbidden Science Journals. And he said at one point he went and talked to Sagan at a conference or whatever. And he asked Sagan if he could put together the 10 best UFO cases, would Sagan take an honest look at them and tell him what he thought? And Sagan said yes. So Val Valet got to work. He compiled these big files for each one of these cases with like the best documented evidence of UFOs, et cetera, brought it to Sagan, who then said, I don't have time for that. I don't, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So Sagan's mind was made up, whether it was made up by him or someone else, yeah. you know, he seems, he seems to have gone from being, you know, a very cutting edge researcher to one that just towed the line. Not invented here. Huh? A not invented here type person. If he yeah. didn't create it, if it wasn't his idea, then it's not going to fly. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. And That's unfortunately, a lot of these people get get in a position of authority where they, you know, they they feel the power that they, you know, they wield, and uh, there can be someone who blows them completely out of the water, but because they have, you know, they have the bully pulpit, you know, the person that has the the truth isn't being heard, and all you're hearing is the static coming out from the uh, the ones that won't yeah. open their eyes to you know to what's happening. Well, it's so, also telling the status quo. This is this yeah. is the right info, even if it's yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we see that all the time, right? Like Neil deGrasse yeah. Tyson. Like there are science scientists that seem to be, um, and I'm not saying he's not a scientist. I don't know why I put it in air quotes. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are scientists like that are these kind of these popular scientists, right? That seem to do that for whomever uh, is that they toe the line, right? And yeah. they'll be oh, like, yeah. aliens? <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. Like there's <laughs> no proof that there's life out there. You know, like they say like the most ridiculous things, we know that's ridiculous. Even as a scientist, you should know, you can't say no, how do you know? Like yeah. Your, yeah. your job as a scientist is to ask questions is to research things, is to look into it, is to test things. No, you know? you're, 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 the job of a scientist is to agree with the people that are funding them. Yes. That's well, yes. A lot yeah. of them are. Like, unfortunately. 90, I mean, if, if, if they were independently wealthy, they would probably, and they had their own funding, they didn't have to count out a, some bureaucrat or whatever. Hmm. Uh, I think the answers would be different. Right. And then the ones that do want to do something different can't find the funding for it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and then you see someone like Stephen Hawking when he when he comes out and says there's, I I don't know if he actually said there was no God or science proved there's no God, but that's how it was reported. Mm -hmm. He may have just said science doesn't prove there's, a, but you know, like that's not something you can't prove a negative first of all, right? And not exactly scientific uh, studies, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like no matter what you consider God, uh, you know, like science really doesn't doesn't have that 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 study there you know mm -hmm. yeah it's, he, it's like trying to say like ghosts don't exist we don't even know how to test for that exactly right, right. so how can we say they don't exist same thing my, with, yeah my, my thing with all of this is that 
all whether it be UFOs, you know, cryptids, uh, ghosts, all of this stuff has been experienced throughout written history across culture. It's named different things, it's interpreted different ways, but if you look at the archetype, it's there throughout human history, as far as mm -hmm. back as, as we have records, which says there's something to it. Whether it's something external or something internal to the human experience, it's real on some level. So to say it doesn't exist is intellectually dishonest. There is something there. It's affecting us. It may not be, you know, if you want to say, well, you know, the ghosts aren't spirits of the dead. Well, we don't know that, but you know, that's different than saying there's no ghosts. Right. Ghosts. People have experienced things that they call ghosts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean they're spirits of the dead. It just means that this phenomenon that we currently refer to as ghosts has been with us forever. So there's something to it. We've always seen weird stuff in the sky. The UFO phenomena has always existed in some form, but you go back to medieval times and it's signs from God rather than aliens from another planet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you go to Aboriginal cultures, they'll they, they have a whole spiritual explanation, which may very well be closer to the truth uh, than anything we have. Hmm. Very true. You know, the shamanic experience of, of, of going into the other world, being taken apart and put back together again, oftentimes with like an implant type device mm -hmm. and then being brought back to this world. I mean, that sounds like an alien abduction to me. Yes. With a very different context. Wow. That's yeah. fascinating. That is fascinating. I've never thought about it that way. That is very true. I mean, I, I honestly believe that when people have these... Um, these these alien abduction type experiences that these are potentially shamanic awakenings, mm -hmm. but we don't have a context for it. Yeah. So it becomes something scary. I mean, because the shamanic awakenings are not these love and light, peaceful things. These are, are right. things where you're, you're facing the deepest, darkest parts of yourself that they probably to a lot of people in our culture would come across as demonic or evil, mm -hmm. but it's really us facing ourselves, the parts we don't want to see in order to become more whole. Yeah. And so you look at that, you look at those shamanic journeys and you look at these alien abduction experiences and other similar experiences. They're very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And then you realize people see grays and DMT trips and ayahuasca mm -hmm. trips, and you have grays on cave walls, 30,000 years old, mm -hmm. made probably by shamans <laughs> who are also on these shamanic trips. So, I mean, this is a, for whatever reason, that image sticks with us. And some people will interpret it as, as, well, aliens were here 30,000 years ago. Look, there's an image of a gray. Maybe they're right. But to me, this is like, this is a shamanic awakening that's been going on to various people throughout history. But we have no spiritual context for it anymore. Hmm. We've been so separated from that part of ourselves that these things now just become terrifying. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how to deal with it. There's a good documentary called... Uh, it's not Visitor of Another World. Um, damn, it's on Amazon. We did a show on it. It's a it's about a guy in South in uh, I think it was South America, mm -hmm. who has a abduction experience. He sees his dead father, um, and he wrestles with this his entire life. He was a kid when this happened, mm -hmm. um, and they take him back to his cultures or his native culture, and they help him integrate it spiritually. Hmm. Oh. And it's it's a really powerful documentary. Oh, that sounds great. Sounds and really Jacques Vallée was a part of that case as well. Interesting. I would definitely have to check that out. Um, David Martin has a really interesting question too. Do we really know what space and time are? No, especially not time. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, time is a weird one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we experience it, but... We may be experiencing it all at once and our brain is just filtering it into sequential order. Yes, that's what I think. I do believe that all time is happening simultaneously. Can you say simultaneously when you're saying how many? Yes. Um, <laughs> gets very tricky. Very, very yeah. tricky. It's that whole um, the Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, right. Scenario. Yes, Kurt Vonnegut. Yes. Very good, very good book. Or yep. There's a movie, I think, too, right? There is a movie, uh, yes. And it's a decent it. movie, too. I haven't seen the movie yet, but yeah, it is. Uh, it was great. Yeah. And it talks about how um, time is. Um, yeah. 
they, I, I think had, he described it as circular, all happening at the same time. I had a guest on the show on Where Did the Road Go uh, a couple of years ago. Can't remember his name off the top of my head. But he just had these weird experiences, and a lot of them he connected to a Bigfoot encounter. Hmm. But as we really delved into it, it sounded like he was experiencing things out of sync. Interesting. Like his friend was, got lost in the woods and heard these noises and then heard him yelling for him, but he wasn't out there. But then a little bit later, he was out there yelling for him. And so when his friend heard him again, he's like, are you real? Huh. And, and I'm, you know, he's telling me all this. And every one of these encounters seemed to have a time element to them. Like they're standing by these railroad tracks and they feel a train go by, but there's no train. Hmm. And they're like, was this the Bigfoot? And I'm like, what if you were just picking up stuff from an hour later? When there was a train going by. And like the more he thought about this, he's like, oh my God. <laughs> because all the experiences seem to be this time slip phenomena. Interesting. But he was really into Bigfoot. So he's looking at it as is this a Bigfoot encounter? Interesting. He's looking at it through the Bigfoot lens. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, I love that. Um, so yeah, so my ever so intelligent husband uh, is saying uh, time is relative and it's because we create it as we go because we are the experiencers. So is it the, the particle wave phenomena? Like, is it what we perceive it to be? Right. Yeah. As opposed to something constant. Or how about when we were kids, summer lasted forever. <laughs> and as adults, my God, it, I mean, my, for some reason, when I'm thinking about current things, mm -hmm. I'm back in the early nineties. That's 30 years ago. So Where in the hell did the last 30 years go? I mean, it's just boom, it's gone. Or if you're running late for something, all of a sudden time moves at like super speed. Yeah. All yeah. Of the, like... yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, Jane Roberts channeled this entity, Seth. It's the only channel, channeled entity I give any credit to whatsoever. Yeah. Because there's a lot of really profound stuff in there and stuff that they couldn't have known about when it was channeled that turned out to be scientifically true. Hmm. Uh, but one of the things Seth said is that he talks about the brain as being kind of a limiter. And he said hmm. that time passes at the speed that your consciousness can perceive reality. So when there's a lot of things going on, your, your processor is running faster. So time runs faster. When there's <laughs> not a lot going on, your brain slows, you know, time slows down because your processor is not running as fast. And I thought about that and I'm like, he's totally on the mark. That's exactly what happens. Cause if you're really busy, time just zips right by. Mm -hmm. If you're rushing to get ready for say time, just zips right by. But if you're just sitting there waiting at like a you're, doctor's appointment or something, it's like, or it's your plane's been, been or you're playing, your flight's been canceled. You right. Wait for the next fight. God, it's going to five minutes seems like an hour. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yes, but that makes so much sense. I get so mad at time when I'm running late, which yes. is frequently. Because so I'm like, did you stop going so fast? Like, what the heck? Did you just stop moving for an hour? And I then know, you thought, right? I actually thought down. that early. When I was getting ready for the show, I was running a little late. And I'm like, if I just, if time could just stop for like an hour. And I'm like, well, maybe it just did. And I didn't know because I wasn't moving through time. Am I the only one that's like, okay, maybe if I think about time moving slower, it'll happen. It doesn't. But every now and then that crosses my mind. <laughs> right. Yes. It doesn't. <laughs> can, can we control our can, can we control our perception of time? That'd be great, right? And our I think experience. I think we yeah. can. I think we can too, but to I limited degrees. Can. Yeah. Okay, and we wait. certainly can on hallucinogens. I mean, I guess we're not controlling it then. It's just kind of participating. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. A different experience yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, time is it's the experience of it, really, when it comes down to. Yes. Yeah. That is very true. That is very, very true. Um, so I wonder if it's just making me think of, and this is where this stuff gets so interesting, because you never know how it's all tied together, right? Like, sometimes like different scenarios, like we're talking about time and our ex perception of it. And what I was thinking of, well, I wonder if that plays into missing time that people have when they have. Could be. 
so-called, you know, like it, it encounters, whether they're UFO or, you know, whether they, they believe they've seen ET and I'm not saying they have it up, uh, but we could, we could be experiencing something that our brain doesn't have a context for mm -hmm. the brain gets overwhelmed and time just starts flying by without you realizing that's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're maxing out the processor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so fascinating. It's so fascinating. And then you wonder too, like, okay, well, if let's just say if these ET are visiting us on this planet, right? Do they have a different understanding of time? And do they have a different, um, because of that different understanding of time, do they have a different way of using time to their advantage? Oh, I mean, that's the movie Arrival. Right, right. Yeah. And I mean, that was brilliantly done to show that their their whole language and everything was was connected to a very different view of time. Right. That's true. That was very similar to Slaughterhouse Five too. I never put those two together. Yeah, a little bit. The circle. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to, and then you got to wonder: Are we also experiencing multiple realities? Right. You know, I feel like there's certain things in our lives that are preordained to some degree. I mean, maybe we could screw it up if we try hard enough, but it's, it's <laughs> almost right. like going through a pond and like there are certain objects that are dropped into that pond and you're going to get at least a wave from it at some point. Hmm. Like it's unavoidable. It's just how much of the, the wave you're going to catch as mm -hmm. you make your decisions going through life. Yeah. See, I don't know though, because then I always have trouble with like, well, who ordained it? Yeah. Some say God. Well, maybe maybe you something. before you were here. Right. Yes. Maybe, maybe I was just like, you know what? Maybe you've been here before. Exactly. Maybe. maybe. Or maybe. So here's where it gets really, really trippy, right? Maybe you have been here before. Say we do live multiple lifetimes, and I do think we do. Now, if all time is happening simultaneously, does that mean there's an infinite number of Jim Goodalls all living life right oh, now? God right? forbid. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna scare it. You're gonna scare the hell out of a lot of people. <laughs> In my first year on Where the Road Go, I had a woman on who did past life regressions. Mm -hmm. Julia something. Uh it was in like July of 2013. Yeah. And she uh she was also uh did uh, talked about the Seth material and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't super familiar with her work and I don't trust hypnosis now. Like I did then because I've realized from talking to people, I've found that hypnosis is not a good memory recovery tool. So then that brings up, is it a good tool for past life regressions? But she told one story that I found absolutely fascinating. She was past life regressing this woman and all her past lives were Julia's past lives. Like every, you know, the woman kept recalling these things and they were her. And she finally got so creeped out. She ended the session and told the woman to leave. Interesting. Oh, geez. And so that suggests that maybe they were the same person in different incarnations. Or this woman was very psychic and was picking up what Julia believed to be her past lives. I, like I know idea. <laughs> I know I was here during the French Revolution. Mm. I know if if you saw the movie uh, Dangerous Liaisons, I was the John Malkovich character. I have not. I mean, I I worked for I worked for five French speaking companies. Uh, mm. Two of them were in Quebec, uh, one in Switzerland, and and the rest are in Germany, and uh, not not Germany in France. I also worked for German companies, but uh, I was with some of my engineers. We were in Brittany in, in, in Western France. That's where uh, our production facility was. And we we're driving to Paris. We you know, we we're going on two lane roads and we we're getting hungry. And I said, well, I know about a mile up the road, you, know, you have to turn off and go another quarter of a mile. There's a great restaurant, a great cafe. I'd never been there before, but I knew it was there. I had been to it. I mean, how in the hell did that happen? Other than the fact that I, I've been around, I, I've been here before. And years I, ago, I met I met a lady. From, she was from Dresden, Germany, East Germany at the time. because before the unification. And she, she said she was a witch. And she told me, says, you have been here multiple times. I can sense it. 
And he said, and this is early, early 80s, late 70s. He says, you're, go you're going to, uh, you're going to meet Bill Gates or someone of his level at, at some time in your life. And, well, when I was the curator in Hawaii at the Pacific Aviation Museum, my boss called me up. And this is 30 years later. He said, I want you to come to, come to Hangar 79. There's someone here I want you to, I want, want you to meet. So I walked over into Hangar 79. And who did I meet? I met Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft. Nice. Now, 30 years before, this woman said I was going to meet him and I would have, you know, I would spend the day. I spent five hours with Paul Allen. <laughs> I gave him a tour of, of our museum and I gave him a, uh, a personal tour of the, the USS Missouri. Well, and, you're, go on. Your, your description of, of knowing the restaurant there is actually uh, the analogy I used to explain to people precognition. Like it's like sitting in a car and you're driving down the highway on a road neither of you have ever been on. And you're in the passenger side and you look out the side and there's a, there's a sign on the side of the road that, that says rest area two miles. And it's kind of half covered in weeds, but you see it because you're not driving. And you're like, hey, there's a rest area in two miles. And the person driving goes, how would you know that? We've never been here before. And they don't believe you. And then two miles later, there's a rest area. And they're like, how did you know? And it's like, it's perception. It's, it's mm -hmm. what, you're, what you're perceiving at any given time. Some of us pick up different information than others. There, there aren't a lot of signage for, for restaurants oh, no. and stuff like that in Europe. No, no, I wasn't saying yeah. that's what happened to you. I'm just saying yeah. like that, it, that reminded no, but me it of makes sense. how I describe precognition because sometimes I'll just know something. I don't know why I know it and it'll, I'll know it's, it's accurate. And then it turns out to be true. And sometimes it can be six months down the road or in one case, six years down the road. Mm. And it's like, okay, so is everything preordained? Like, you know, six years is a long time. It's one thing to have precognition of something that's going to happen tomorrow, mm. but who knows what can happen to you over a six year period. That that's a long period of time. For seven years, I told my ex, my first wife that I was going to be in downtown San Francisco during a major earthquake. And I described it. I said, there would be a full moon. I can see the flagpole, the ferry buildings tilted over. Now I grew up in the Bay area. I grew up in the Mountain View, Los Alamos. I have family in the East Bay. I went to Los Alamos high school down in Silicon Valley. So the chances of me staying in San Francisco were, were slim, but I was there for, is in 1989, October 89, and I was at Moscone and we'd shut up, closed shop and we were uh, heading back to the hotel when we had the Lama Prieta earthquake. Mm. But I had been telling my, I'd been telling my ex-wife when I was still married to her, I kept, I keep having this recurring dream that I'm going to be downtown San Francisco during an earthquake. And I was, and I, and it blew her away. I mean, she was, she was freaked out for quite a while, but I also had another one that I didn't tell anybody because it was too outrageous. I, I could picture as clear as, as if you saw it in high def uh, on a big screen TV, uh, wide bodied air, uh, uh, commercial aircraft hitting the World Trade Center. Hmm. And it was so outrageous, I, wouldn't, I didn't tell anybody. A lot of people had that precognition. I think that was one of those events in our history that, I mean, random number generators at that point stopped being random. Huh. <laughs> I feel like that was a fixed point in time. Like that was going to happen no matter what. It was supposed to happen for whatever reason. Yeah. You know, plenty of people got, got you know, didn't go into work who worked in the, you know, World Trade Center or around the World Trade Center. Mm -hmm. um, so many people, I mean, there's so much art of planes flying into the World Trade Center just a year or two years prior to it. Dream Theater's uh, live record, which was supposed to come out on the day the Trade Center was hit, had the backdrop of New York City with the World Trade Center on fire. Oh, my gosh. They had to pull it because they were like, oh, my God, you can't put this out today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, there's time does not work like we think it does. And the other thing that, that like Dr. Bem at a Cornell, when he did his precognition experiments, verified once again that the things that we pick up on the best in the future are the highly emotional things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 9-11 was a very highly emotional thing. So it's not surprising that a lot of people picked up on you, you being in, a, uh, in an earthquake. I mean, I'm sure that was a, a stressful, emotional moment being in san francisco in an earthquake 
Well, I've been in five big ones. I've been in five major earthquakes, about all above seven on the scale. Oh uh, man! One one of them was lasted for five minutes, and it was nine point two. Wow! It was, where was, it was that? Good Friday, Anchorage, Alaska, nineteen sixty four. Wow. March 27th. Is that the one that caused the, the huge tsunamis as well? Yep. That's the one that yeah. hit Crescent City and, and whatever. But the the one that's going to be scary, uh, I was talking to one of the volcanologists at Kilauea. And uh, they said, there's a big crack in the big island. They call it the rift. And the this chunk of the big island is separating from, from the main part of the island. And... It said it'll break off, maybe it break off bits and pieces. Most of it's underwater, but it's in 17,000 feet of water. And they're saying that, this is the volcanologist saying that if it goes off all in one piece, it's 60 cubic miles of the big island is going to fall down 17,000 feet to the ocean wow. floor. Yeah. And it's going to trigger a tsunami between 1,500 and 3,000 feet high for the entire Pacific Rim. Ugh. So that's an end of the world scenario. Wow. Well, that's a yeah. good thought. I, I, I believe uh, on the edge of the Canary Islands, there is a, uh, it's a Cape Verde pack. Islands. The what? Cape Verde Islands. Uh, Canary Islands. The, I, know the, I know the Canary Islands. There's one that oh. split. And it's going to break off eventually. Yeah, and when it does, it could cause tsunamis all the way down the east coast of the Atlantic. Yeah, oh they're God. they're they're predicting that tsunami, if it goes or when it goes, it's not an if; it's a when. Yeah, when uh, the tsunami will reach uh, Disney World in Orlando. Wow. Well, the highest point in the state of uh, state of Florida is two hundred and sixty feet above sea level. Right. 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 Space right. Mountain's higher than that. <laughs> so just be on Space Mountain when it happens, you might be yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there'll be nothing. Go right left. off, you'll be fine. There'll be nothing left. Yeah, I mean, because so, uh, about one hundred and forty thousand years ago, one hundred forty. Yeah, I, mean, I think one hundred forty thousand years ago, a chunk of Oahu broke off and did the same thing in the back of the Koalau Mountains uh, on the windward side, and the debris field goes out one hundred and twenty miles. Yeah. And it said it caused a thousand to fifteen hundred foot tsunami, you know, throughout uh, most of the Pacific at the and time. And it, one of the problems with science today is that they're all gradualists. They don't believe in catastrophe. They think all the catastrophes are behind us. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. And they, you know, only now are they starting to do things like look for asteroids. And mm. you know, I mean, and how many close calls have we had now that they've been looking, or the one that came down in in Russia? That was, a, you know, luckily not worse than it was. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we could get hit by a um, by a solar flare that would knock out all our technology, send us back to the Stone Age immediately. We can prevent that. There's there's stuff we could do to prevent that. It wouldn't cost a lot of money, but Congress won't pass any bills to do it Why? because they don't want to spend the money, even though it's not a lot. They don't want to spend it, and. Well, maybe you know, they should just not give themselves a raise that year. Yeah, and that, then yeah. Them it's the only thing they can agree on. <laughs> <Yeah>. Up, <laughs> up at up at Kit, Kit Peak National Observatories, um, about fifty miles west of Tucson, they have twenty-two optical telescopes. Two of them, they're I think they're both two, uh, two meter or a little bit bigger uh, primary mirrors. And they're, they're, uh, it's a Skywatch group. There's uh, a group of graduate students from the University of Arizona. And their job is to keep track of all known Earth orbit crossing asteroids and comets. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, but, it, but at least it seems like nowadays about once every two or three weeks, oh, that we've just discovered something new heading our way. And it's big and it's going to cross between the moon in us, which yeah, is, yeah. you know, in our neighborhood. Yeah. And it's just, uh, uh, so but it's, it, it's, it's a, big, it's a big universe out there. You see your movies where somebody going through the asteroid belt and they're trying to avoid hitting objects. The average distance between rocks in the, in the, in the asteroid belt is 640 some odd thousand miles. 
yeah. yeah. So if you hit something going through the Astro Boy belt, what either you were really a piss poor driver, <laughs> uh, or you have a very bad nav navigator, or you're just unlucky. <laughs> What, what I yeah. found out in what I found interesting lately um, is that you can fit every planet in the solar system between the Earth and Moon. Really? And I thought that can't be right. And then yeah. I looked it up, and it turns out, yeah, you can. And I'm like, that's that's a lot. No wonder we don't go to the Moon more. <laughs> yeah. Really? Is that true? Like even yeah. Jupiter and Saturn? Like they're yeah, gigantic. even Jupiter and Saturn. And you, you notice on speaking about Jupiter, the uh, the one of the newest uh, James Webb telescope images of Jupiter, you can see a real faint ring. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that was that, that was just you know really cool. Yeah. And some of the images that are coming out now are absolutely unbelievable. And I and I believe one of them they it was on yes last week or the week before last, it showed a a star. And at least two or three planet planets orbiting the star. They were they oh. were distinguishable in the image. Nice. I did not see that one. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. So, so. I wonder. Are so we, are all of these on Instagram? They got to be right on their NASA page. Google search will probably find them. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was this? It, this was recently. Last couple of weeks, yeah. And well, the, the, the telescope hasn't been on, up that long, so That's since true. June. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, what I did just be, before, it, you know, once it got to L two, whatever you call it, uh, waiting for the first images. I had a, a, a someone sent me it's a picture of a backlit cover it says "Remove before flight." And you're looking through the back oh, yeah. of it. <laughs> and that's on the camera. <laughs> I mean, and it as, as bad as they screwed up Hubble, it was you know, it was something that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. At yeah. least they salvaged stuff with Hubble. Well, the, the, the I think the primary mirror was ground to that of the KH eleven because what Hubble is is a modified uh KH eleven uh big bird satellite spy satellite and they mm. just changed some of the optics added some additional equipment and, and pointed in the other direction yeah that makes so, sense yeah yeah so i think uh let me see if this is what you were let me see i think i can share this uh share screen hopefully i found the right one all right is this it uh yes exoplanet hip I think this is the one. Yeah. Interesting. There's the plant. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. But uh, the, uh, the yellow one has more objects around it. Of course that may be in the background too. Mm. So now yeah, it was, it was, it was during, it was in this grouping. I don't think it, it may not have been exactly that, but yeah. If, if I, if it comes up again and I find it, I'll, uh, um, I will, I will put it on my desktop so I can pull it up the next time we get together. Yeah, that's fantastic. Wow, that's very yeah. cool. Yeah. Wow. That just means we're not alone. <laughs> well, we know that already. Right. That's, that's yeah. just sensible. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. I I agree with Soraya though. I think that there is probably life everywhere. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I also lean toward the idea that consciousness creates matter, not not the not that we're the side effect of matter. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. So then that gets into like, well, is it this holographic universe and is it right. a holographic universe of like created by consciousness? Exactly. Are we a computer program? That, yeah. There's, <laughs> you know, I, I look around sometimes and I'm like, it really does make sense if we're a computer program. But someone should put some bad software and there's, there's some, you know, there's some uh, malware in there too. <laughs> I, I, I like the I like the idea of thinking of like our higher self as the person playing the game. They can't directly control us. We're just we're in the game doing our thing, and as our higher self, we have to go. No, no, no. Go this way. Go. Don't do that. Do do the. Oh, you're not listening. You know. And other people <laughs> listen, and they're like, yeah. And you know, it's like some people are like, oh, my life sucks, and. And I, I, everything I do is wrong, and it's like because you're not you're you're the guy who's playing you isn't very good. Yeah. He's not getting through to you to go in the other direction. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or he's or he's enjoying you going through this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that too. Oh my gosh. It's so fascinating. All these different things. I mean, I, I wonder if at some point we'll ever figure it out, but I kind of hope we don't then because you know I mean I, it, it's it, it's it's a fun it's a fun trip regardless. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm enjoying I'm I'm enjoying the uh I'm enjoying the ride. Jim Elvich has a book out called Digital Consciousness. Uh, where he shows all the evidence that we live in a digital-based world versus an analog world, and it's it's a really fascinating book. Okay, a digital-based world. So basically, that we are living in a computer program type situation. Sort of. Sort of. Now, now what happens when we get hit, get hit with a massive corona mass ejection, and there, and all the ones and zeros turn to either ones or zeros? I mean, the only people who aren't going to know it are the Aboriginal. Uh, people yeah. wherever the Amish, the Quakers, and the yep, Mennonites. Yep. <laughs> That's when I go see my Amish neighbors, my, my Amish neighbors and be like, help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be like, you idiots. You should have listened yeah. to us all along. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, it wouldn't cost us much to uh to protect this stuff, protect our power plants and, and all this other stuff. They just won't do it because they don't care. Congress does not look forward. They, 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 all they care about is getting elected again so they can keep their high pay. Mm. They're so reactionaries. They're, yeah, they're reactionaries. Exactly. So they don't care about a, well, this might happen. I mean, it's going to happen. We're going to get hit with a massive flare at some point. It might be tomorrow. It might be 100 years from now, but it's going to happen. And we we'll don't have eight even hours have, notice. Yeah. And we don't even have backup power generators it's not like if your power plant goes down oh they just go put another one in they have to build it from scratch and now none of the factories will work so they can't build it from scratch and you can't, you can't and you can't drive there because oh your yeah. your your computer run car what well, an average i think the new new cars have an average of over 100 uh, microchips in it yep no oh. yep and i'll, I'll go I'll, I'll go find yes I go find myself a forty-eight Studebaker, and that'll get me where I want to go. Yeah. I even I even had one for a while when I was in Denver back in '62. <laughs> so, so we're coming to the end of our time there, Miss Lynn. We are, we yeah. are, and I'm so excited, Soraya, that you were able to come on with us. And I'm I always... delighted too. It's just yeah, been fun. Great. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a good conversation with you. I'm so excited. So. Uh, thank you. And thank you for being so kind with my for forgetfulness today. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, that was fine. <laughs> oh, goodness. But I had a great time chatting with you. And um, oh, let everybody know where they can find you and your podcast. Um, um, do you know when your books, are, a book is going to be out or books? No, not okay. really. Um, sometime in the future. At, yeah, sometime <laughs> in the future. Uh, where did the road go dot com is has links to everything. Uh, if you're into heavy music, thelastexit.org has all the links to my music show, which is six and a half hours a week. Um, where did the road goes? You, uh, I've had a show every week since January of 2013. Wow. wow. Sometimes there's more. Sometimes there's two or three, but there's always at least one. Good um, for you. And uh, Christopher Ernst has been working on a documentary about me and where did the road go that will be debuted at uh the strange realities conference in nashville in october well that's awesome so well i can't wait to hopefully we'll all be able to see it eventually yes yeah that's awesome well yeah. we'll have to have you talk to you again when that comes out and I want to hear sure. all about it yeah. i think that'll be fantastic and the books, I mean, as soon as I can get them done, they'll get done. But it's it's also it, it, working on an autobiography, I've learned, is also a lot of shadow work. Mm. It's a lot of looking into your past and dealing with things yes. as well as just writing. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And and it has to like it, it'll affect everybody else that's in the book as well. Yeah, I'm being <laughs> very careful there. about that. Yeah, that's got to be tough. It's a tricky one. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be amazing. I, can't I hope wait. so. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Absolutely. All right. Oh, and look at this. Enzo is on the ball. And yes, he, thank you, Enzo. There you go. The last exit. Ah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Soraya. And everybody hang on because Jim and I have an announcement to tell you guys. Um, but 
Thank you, Soraya. You have been wonderful. We're not getting married. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're really aliens. Yep. <laughs> Let me, let me let me take the mask off. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A buddy, a buddy of mine's into uh, Star Wars and and stuff like that, and he's a reenactor. He has the most real predator mask and outfit. He has the whole yeah. thing. That's so cool. he can't wear it very long because it's all latex, and it, you know, if, uh, if yeah. you're in a place that's hot and humid, uh, it's, you know, you're gonna lose a lot of weight. But it, you know, you, he has an, He has the head in his in his closet. And we open up his closet. The first thing you see is this head looking at you. I, mean, I knew it was there, but it sort of it sort of gets you. And you say, "What yeah. the hell was that?" Yeah, that's quite a head to like quite a face to be greeting you. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, that's awesome. Yeah. It yeah. is. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, and I en I thoroughly enjoyed meeting you, and yeah, uh, I look forward to you know, uh, having another session with you here down the road a ways, and absolutely it's a lot of fun. Be a lot of fun. I think there's gonna be a lot of changes in the world over the next thirty to ninety days. We'll see. <laughs> it's just pretty much constant at this point. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty true. much. Yeah, true, true. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sor Soraya. I'm gonna stick you backstage, and everybody stick around. Um, Jim and I have, like I said, we have an announcement. We are not getting married. I just did that. So, uh, but not to Jim. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, no, I, I, I have an, I've been married you, enough times. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I have, I have the Antichrist. I have the fraud. My first wife and I were still close to. So, <laughs> those are his ex-wives. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I figured. Yep. Yeah. Well, have a great night, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, you, you too. too. You take care. All right. Thanks. It was, a, it was a fun two hours, by the it way. Was. I really enjoyed it. Oh, so, good. you have All a good right. one. Have a great night, Sarai. All right. So thank you everyone for hanging out. We had so much fun talking with Soraya. Um, and I know everybody was enjoying it. I was looking at the chat and reading it. Um, but Jim and I have an announcement. So for those that don't know, which probably most of you don't, I am in the process of moving. Uh, I'm going to be moving to Ohio. So it's a little crazy and hectic right now. So we are going to be taking a little bit of a break and by a little bit of a break, we mean probably a couple of months. Uh, so it's, I'm going to be moving next month. So it's, it's a little crazy right now, but I think it'll be good. So I get time to pack, move, unpack. It's craziness. I hate moving. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to die here. So I'm not going to move again. <laughs> oh, stop it. <laughs> but I'm going to be 105 when I do it. So yeah. <laughs> Well, that's good. Yes. So we still got some time. Oh, good. And so Sor uh, sub to Soraya's podcast, um, the YouTube version of Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, good. Soraya's great. I, I knew you guys would love him. So yeah, he is fantastic. Super, super that was, smart. That was a fun session. I look, for, I, mean, I look forward to it again. And I look forward to... Uh, I, my wife is calling me. I got to run. <laughs> Just a second. Okay. <laughs> yeah, babe. Um, yeah. I'm in the air. He's doing that. <laughs> um, so yeah, okay. Hopefully, I can keep an eye and talk. Oh, there we go. Okay, there you go. She, she's in Seattle right now. Oh, yeah. that's right. And that's right. She doesn't miss me. She misses the hairy thing that's on the floor down underneath me. Yeah. <laughs> Her name is Scarlet. Yeah. Scarlet. My, my sweetie oh, dog. Scarlet in there with you. She's been so good. No, oh, she oh. been. Well, I, she's. With thunderstorm, she gets oh. really hyper. So I have her thunder shirt on, and I have uh, the, the vet gave me some medication for her to keep her calm. Oh, probably, we, probably doggy Prozac or something like yeah. that. We yeah, we do Benny butter in this house, which is okay. a lovely concoction of Benadryl and peanut butter. Okay, <laughs> for the that dog. works. But, that works too. Yes. So, yes. oh, here you go, Jim. So during our sabbatical, you got an offer. Ron from oh. Cosmic Neighbors, who we had on. Jim, you can always hang out with me till I come back or till we come back here. That sounds good to me. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So. You just tell me you know, when and where uh, you can get uh, all the information from Lynn. Yep. If I didn't give it to you, Ron, let me know. Um, I can't remember if I did or not. I think I did, but just in case, let that me would know. Be, that would be fun. I I really enjoy this. I really do. And I've I've absolutely enjoyed everybody you know we've had on. 
I, I even I even made a new friend. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, Jared Murphy and I we just clicked. Even mm-hmm. when I was back in Minneapolis, we, you know, we spent uh, hours upon hours just you know talking, chewing, you know, shooting the bull. Uh, and uh, and 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 Michael's like my kid, uh, yeah. and I know he would uh, he would enjoy it as well. So yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I definitely can't wait to see yeah, that. So. And you have a, uh, you do well in packing. Don't break anything. I know, uh, right? Once, once you get all situated, and and again, uh, you can tell. You know, I'm sure you know, Dave is listening. Uh, I will be in Ohio sometime spring, and uh, I, uh, I will be, I will be looking up you. I'll be looking up Lynn and uh, a lot of other very, very dear friends of mine in the, in the greater Dayton area. So. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I'm yeah, the boss. But... <laughs> yes, Sounds and good. yes. So David Hurley, Jim, Jim, yes, Jim told me. I don't I don't yeah. know if you heard what well, before the show. Jim's gonna take us through the Air Force Museum. Ah, I can't wait. And yeah, and I, since I, I know the facility manager, uh I'll get I'll I'll get back into the areas that are not open to the public. <sighs> oh, and I'm going to get a picture with me and Jim in front of the SR-71. I'm going to blow it up to poster size and frame it. It's going to be great. <laughs> I'm, I, have a, I have a photo that's, that's, that's owed to me. I have a, uh, I, I, I'm getting a photo of Bob Lazar holding my Blackbird book, which is the one up behind me here, wow. and my 75 years of the Lockheed Skunk Works book. And I sent them both to him. I said, the only requirement, I want a picture. I want a photo of you holding the books. Yes. So. Oh, that yeah. would be amazing. Yes, absolutely. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. And I know. And I want a picture when you're with Bob next time. I want like a Jim I, and Bob selfie that you send to me. Depending <laughs> on weather, uh, I can't drive in the snow. My car right. does not drive in the snow. But I'm going to be in Vegas next week or the week after next with Dave, uh, Dave mm-hmm. Scott. And then from there, I'm gonna. I if if all things work out right, I'm I'm gonna go visit Bob Lazar, spend a couple of days with him. Awesome. That's if he's there. I mean, um, but they're they're having wildfires in the area that he's uh-huh. living. You know, near. I mean, in the general part of the state, they're having wildfires. Uh, yeah. So that may that may screw things up, and an early winter uh, will ca- cause it. Uh, I already have a picture of me in an SR-71 and in an A-12 and in a YF-12. So well, He's saying you and me need to be in the cockpit of the SR-71. I don't know if we can pull those kind of strings, but. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I, uh, if we, if we did it, it would have to be before or after the museum. Uh, if I can open. get in the cockpit of an SR-71, I will come in at 2 a.m., I will yeah. be there at any time. You just I, I will I will I will ask my my friend if it's if it's if it's possible and that would be fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That would be great. Yep. <laughs> yep. So alrighty. All right. Oh you, well. yeah, keep you know, keep me in the in the loop of you know how things are going. Yes. And uh, uh, absolutely. We'll we're keep everybody running. We'll keep, yeah, we'll keep in touch with everybody. Yep, yep. All right. I gotta go. Good. You have a wonderful evening, dear, and uh, give my best to, to Dave, and I will. I will I will see you later. All right. You give Scarlett a pat for us. I will. You take care. All right. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs>